So we are here to talk about Feast of Seven Fishes. And our panel today, fabulous. Let's start with Lynn Cohen. We'll get back to that in just a second. Don't whisper. <laughs> no whispering, no whispering. My name is Lynn Dowie Davis. I'm your moderator for today. Robert Tinnell. Our director. And Paul Ben Victor. So Robert, I'm gonna start with you. Um, talk to us a little bit about the origin of Where's Feast of Seven Fishes. Loud. To hear. You can hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Speak up. <laughs> Okay. Better. We ready? Yeah. Okay. Robert. <laughs> uh, the origin as a film, because as a as a speak up, Robert. As speak a tradition. <laughs> <laughs> this was like every minute of every day shooting this movie. It was uh, <laughs> there were literally nine cooks in the kitchen. Um, it was something I didn't even know what it was called until I was probably thirty. It was just something that my family did every Christmas Eve, and I just I loved it. And it was um, probably, I don't know, when my grandfather was still alive because my great-grandmother had passed and I suddenly became acutely aware that people were just, you know, dying. And with them, these uh, wonderful traditions and recipes. And, and at the same time, I was sort of deeply aware of how Christmas was going from being this thing when you actually did things and had memories and made decorations. You know, you did stuff. Right to becoming, trying to be some sort of crate and barrel pottery barn, unbelievably perfect, impossible to pull off stress-inducing, you know, treadmill. Um, I'm not saying the feast doesn't induce stress, because I always say it's like a slow-motion car wreck, but, <laughs> you know, we all stop to look at slow-motion car wrecks, so I made a film about it. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you see, did you pull elements from your own family and traditions that you've developed in your own life into this film? Uh, at unbelievable levels. I mean, we shot in my grandparents' house, where wow. that really, we rented it back, yeah. Uh, Which I'm hasn't been uh, really remodeled touched. since 1922. <laughs> yeah, right, pretty much. Since my grandfather bought it from the coal company, bought both sides and knocked, took a sledgehammer and knocked a hole between the two sides. Um, yeah, scaring it. Yeah, she is, I, when she gives me that look, I'm like... Um, but uh, these were the recipes. I mean, uh, we, we prepared food like we really do or like my family really did. Uh, I mean, the only thing I'd have to say is I'm no way, shape, or form was I Tony. I was never that evolved, certainly never that monogamous at, uh, at 22. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I, just, I wish I had. I wanted to be Tony. Too much information. Too much. <laughs> Lynn, talk to us a little bit about how Let's much. Talk to I'm us. Talk oh. to us a little bit about how much you enjoyed playing Nani. Oh, how could you not? Uh, first of all, women at that stage, that age, who'd lived like that, no matter what nationality you are, what religion you are, it's. Courage, strength, and when the rest of the world, and there was a time, too, when the rest of the world was saying, oh, you're a woman, now you can't do it, you know. Wait, somebody will it, And that's why it touched me so much. And it, it is that wonderful craziness that people have. Particularly if somebody says, no, you can't do that, or it's, it's going to happen, so don't worry about it. It's the courage. Right. And I think that's why I fell in love with this. And courage is what we all must have. And we do all have it somewhere. Yes, we do. And in today's times, we need it more than ever, I think. Um, it's, yes, yes. And you're here, which is so wonderful. You're in a a dark theater, and you came to see this, and it's, it makes me very, very happy. 
because I thought it was a very special event, enterprise, whatever you want to call it. It was a piece of someone's soul. And we had the great advantage of shooting it in an area with all those people and the food. That's where I went straight for the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and I would come and I said, well, you know, I have to do this, this is for my role. What do I do? You know, <laughs> I chopped, I cut, I peeled, and I drank. <laughs> I had a good time doing all of that. I don't know. I that sounds like yeah. a good combination, Lynn. I love your pants. Oh, thank you. Are those pants? Uh, yeah, they're like a short, like a faux leather short. They're short pants. They're short pants, yes. <laughs> they're very sexy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they spark shine. There's a nice shine on her pants. There's a shine on my pants. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you. Is there a woman in your life that you drew from to play this role? Every woman. Every woman. I mean, that's what the joy of this was in the writing. The women prevail when the world says, you can't. There's not enough money. There's not enough food. You don't know what you're doing. You haven't had the education. Bullshit. <laughs> and it's, uh, yes, it is. And the same way for men. When they say, well, you haven't had the education, you have We're creatures that are amazing that get up when we've been pushed down. And it's, I think, the great message of all film, theater, talks. When people say no, you say, OK, all right. You say no, I'm going to show you. And uh, the courage it takes, the courage it takes to live which is not new to anybody. I, I can hear my husband go, that's enough, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough, Lynn. No, we're loving all of this. We love all of it. <laughs> Paul? Yeah? How are you? Wonderful, fabulous. I'm very inspired, Lynn, by your, uh, <laughs> your words of wisdom. It's something to think about for, you know, as an actor, uh, to, to be as free as you are and open, and it's quite, quite an inspiration to hear you speak that way, and you're funny too, and wonderful, fabulous, and great to work with. We had some good scenes together. Well, Paul, yes. you played Johnny very well. He had the bravado, he had the glasses, but he was also very, very loving. What one characteristic um, really drew you to play this character, and why did you say yes? The glasses, the glasses. The glasses? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, first thing I heard was, you know, Joey Pantoliano's doing it. And we were old friends. We've done a few things together. We did Daredevil and some other stuff. So uh, if, and I, uh, to play with brothers, sort of the idea of playing brothers with Joey, I said, I'm in. And then I read it. Then I spoke to the director. And then uh, we all got together. And then, you know, my big thing was the guys, the, you know, that was our world. And uh, somebody fell out of the role that the other brother was playing, who's Ray Abruzzo, who's a very, very close friend of mine, Ray from Sopranos. <laughs> He'll be very happy that somebody hooted and hollered. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell him tonight, he's gonna love hearing that two people screamed and hollered his name. I have three. Three, three, four. A lot of, <laughs> lot of Sopranos fans. Ray is gonna be very happy. Um, so, and then I read it and I saw what, you know, what potentially could happen here. And then we showed up, met this wonderful director and, uh, the whole family and your whole family and the whole way it was being, you know, grass rooted, put together as one big family. And we were there in the ice cold of, what was it January last yeah. year in West Virginia? So <laughs> a lot of the scenes that you're watching <laughs> We're frozen. I know <laughs> the young kid, uh, you know, Skylar Gisando, who plays the young lead boy, he, he, his lips were frozen when we were out there in the cold. Yeah. And so it was real. But that's what you did when you were a kid. You, you put on a jacket and you went to school in a jacket. There were no such thing as Canadian goose downs back then. Right, right. <laughs> you put on a couple layers and you, <laughs> you walked to school. Yeah, two pairs of socks with holes in them and that was it. But... Um, the whole nature of being a part of this, working in his grandfather's house, which was unbelievably authentic, where 
I know they rolled out of bed in the morning and uh, walked a block down the street and took a 700 foot shaft down to, to dig out the coal. So that was all very much a part of this, as you said, the soul of what was happening in this film and the people around, it just was, it was uh, intoxicating and contagious. We all dove in and became a part of a, a quick, instant family. You know, a lot of us, like we knew each other. I knew Skylar, I knew Joey, you know, I knew people. I first had met Lynn and we just, we, you know, just sort of landed on this little, uh, this little planet together and, and, and became a family and it worked. But it all starts on the page. It all starts on the page that's written, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Robert, yeah, coming back to you. I'm talking about this stuff. <laughs> Are you getting emotional? I always do with this stuff. You know. <laughs> Lynn, you know what I'm, yeah, we, that's okay. what we do. Robert. Wear our heart on our sleeve like that. Yes. <laughs> um, so the film is set in the 80s going into the 90s. What about this era was so appealing to you? Um, well, you know, one, my great-grandmother passed in 84, so this would have been the last Christmas, and I, for whatever reason, that was important to me. Uh, the MTV era was important to me only because it was such a seismic event. Right. You know, it, it, it was, and what cable, what, what this was doing, what it, it was just, it was kind of revolutionary. And within, for me, I mean, I went, I remember one minute I was pouring beer in a college bar in West Virginia, and six months later I was in film school in LA and I was actually working on music videos, you know, with acts that I had seen. So that was, you know, that was kind of like imprinted upon me. But also, you know, it just, man, the spontaneity of life where, you know, that, especially that the night before Christmas Eve where we come from, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, I mean, you're out because it's like, you don't want to be alone. <laughs> you want to have somebody to kind of hang out with to have the romance at Christmas. And you didn't know who was going to be on the other side of the door when you walked into that bar, that club, that restaurant, anywhere. And you know now it's just everything swipe right or however you swipe. I don't know. <laughs> Happily married, so there's no swiping. Uh, but you know there was a there was something just exhilarating about not knowing what was going to happen in your life, not being planned down to you know as if algorithms are going to determine the right soulmate for you or, or you know I don't know they don't I don't think a phone app can generate pheromones yet but you know you you're in the right bar at the right time and the right person sitting across there you might make a real connection and I just wanted to get back to that because it was a really really happy time for me right right and did you <laughs> did you see some of yourself obviously in this in the roles of these or in the characteristics of a lot of the, the what was happening um, in this film starting with the lead character Tony Tony only because you know in a, in a in a in a heavy industry or working you know not, I don't want to say working class culture but you know in that sort of in that culture there everything's measured by the pound by the ton by the foot and abstracts you know ideas art that you didn't work hard for that. So in that respect, I, I related to Tony um, and in loving your family and not wanting to disappoint them. I mean, I kind of think I'm actually more like Juke. I mean, all, all kidding aside, I mean, Juke was sort of cursed with awareness and cursed with memory and cursed with, you know, able to contextualize things and it keeps him out of the moment sometimes, I think. Um, and then I was, I was really, you know, I was so interested in the female characters. I mean, I, I look at them, I'm... Um, I kind of see the big, the big three parts um, of of Beth, Katie, and Nani as three aspects of my wife. You know, because I'm fascinated by my wife. She's a fascinating person. I fell in love with her at Christmas. I, I told her I loved her the first time on Christmas Eve, and I see I see aspects of her in all three. And I I admire all three. I think I know Katie. People think I think Katie's fabulous, and I think like in 15 years Tony's going to be like, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? She was right there. You know. So, so much of the story is rooted in family and tradition. Um, how did you use these notions to bring the actors into the vibe of feeling that and just being used to that on set on a daily basis? Well, I gotta tell you, I mean, I mean let's just, just call, call it what it is. I, I don't know what on earth got me to have this cast, but I trusted them, they were all so I mean, in these two instances, if it couldn't have been them, I don't know what I would have done. Quite honestly, it would not have been in the film that it is. 
<laughs> uh, the we we just made connections. Everybody did the work. Everybody we would sit on the phone. Remember, Paul, we'd be on the phone, and and then my and Paul would call friends of mine to hear how they spoke. He would look at video of my grandfather. I mean, everybody made an effort to be embedded there. And what I decided to do was, they're all everyone in this film was so smart and so quick that we would get what we needed. But then I want to, you know, it's their film, and so we would do improv things. I mean, Paul, I was talking about this morning in an interview. You know, that line you came up with, I love, because I'm not going to lie, I didn't write it. Uh, he goes, can I do something? And I said, yeah. And, and, and uh, Cameron, uh, Vinny in the film, says, what am I, Kojak? And Paul goes, well, you want me to smack that wig off your head? <laughs> and I, I was in the other room, and I started laughing. And I was like, well, yeah, hell, that, that's going in the film. <laughs> and, but, you know, that only, that only happens if you trust the people you're working with, if they trust you, and if you get in this. Blake Edwards said something to me one time. I did an interview. I, want, I just wanted to interview Blake to see how he worked as a director. And he said, you know, I used to care about shot lists and storyboards and all that technical crap. And he goes, but eventually, especially working with Peter Sellers, he said, I, you know, you go in a room, you kind of pretend it's a sandbox, you say to the camera people, go get a coffee, we're going to play. And, and I think we played a lot. I, I mean, I like to think we did. We yeah, played a lot. Yeah. Is there a outtake? at all of this like uh, any kind of real okay because I was wondering this morning actually uh, there was a lot of stuff crazy stuff between everybody the whole family I just thought it'd be fun to see some of that stuff maybe some b-roll one day and when you it might be nice if they ever come back and do a thing you know I'm always loath to put it too close to the film because I hate to pop because for some reason like we really created a world where I keep hearing from people, it's so authentic, it's such a time machine, I've been loath to pop the bubble. But yeah, I'd love, you know, because man, you and Joey and Ray, was, things were said about me, and they have microphones on, I hear things. <laughs> um, speaking about chemistry, for each one of you, with all of the time that you spent together, what did you learn about yourself by being on set with each one of these characters, or each one of these actors, I should say. Oh, gosh. Some, say that again. What, <laughs> what did you learn? It's one of those hard questions. Oh, it's OK. What did you learn about yourself? What did I learn about myself? By being on set mm -hmm. with so many amazing actors. Uh, I kind of think I just have to answer this generally. I mean, you know, every, we're lucky to do this. You know, we don't have nine to five jobs. We get in this creative canvas every time we step on a set. And after doing it for so many years, there's always somebody, a grip or a crew person or an actor or somebody you, thankfully after doing it this many years, you know somebody, I'm sure Lynn could say the same thing. After several decades, you, there's somebody you know and so you dive in. You're just one of the colors of the of the painting, and you and you hope that this one comes out better than the one before, or as good. So what do I learn? I mean, I'm just grateful to be to be able to be on the next job. People always ask me, "What was your favorite, you know, character? What was your favorite job?" And I always say, "The next one, you know, the next one," because <laughs> that's you know, you rub your hands together. Who am I going to be next? So it's, it's, we're just very fortunate to be these parts, parts of this big jazz, you know, concoction that we do. And um, what do I learn? I learned, you know, to, be, to just be f grateful and try to be happy and enjoy it, as opposed to the in-between times when you're hungry and, you, you know, we always stay hungry and want to get that next thing and fight for the next role or find out who it is that's going to hire you for the next thing. To let that go, I think so. I'm answering it more generally speaking, probably. But that's what I do. I just try to learn each time to just enjoy the process. And I think in time, as I'm getting older, you know, that happens naturally as well. But again, I, I, I'm inspired by what Lynn said earlier, you know, just uh, the strength and the courage that, we, that it takes to do this. You know, you've got to stand up and make a fool of yourself, you know, and sometimes and risk doing that. I believe that, yeah. I believe that. What about you, Robert? What about this project? What kinds of things did you learn about yourself and your approach towards completing this project? I learned about myself just going to the grocery store. <laughs> you know, I'm not kidding you. I mean, there has to be so many things to choose from. 
but I loved that, you know, very often in theater or film or TV, what happens off of the screen is what you bring at that moment. And there was so much wonderful things happening. The mom w working in the kitchen that would let me go and cut up things and, you know, tell my life story and my husband won't let me cut things up like this or whatever. But it, it had that environment. I think I, I heard, yeah, let's see, more than I heard no. And that's where the gold is. And it may be a piece of shit that you're thinking of doing, but sometimes out of that piece of shit comes a piece of gold. But, and there was no fear. There was no fear on the set of what are you doing or, you know, uh, um, that's not exactly the... It was um, a true creative project and artistic. I'm not afraid to use that word because art is an everyday thing and it's in your body. And I, I don't know, I would go in and, 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 and peel onions while I was waiting to go on. But everything you did, I mean, it was let's see. Yes. And that's a credit to Robert. To, to the, he gave us that freedom to say, let's see, you know. It really is. Uh, so that's a gift and a blessing to have somebody. I mean, people, you, you have this in all of your lives. People say no before they say yes, or they're afraid of a new idea of, of who you are or the way you look. And so it gave me courage. And uh, I love doing that film for that reason. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Just do it. Life's a minute. A minute! That's my last screaming. <laughs> I can hear my husband go, oh, please, Lynn. <laughs> Robert. I think that um, I finally let go of everything that film school and all of that uh, you know it, it you just driven so much towards the visual and I made a decision in pre-production that there were visuals I want there are visuals I love that I'm super proud of but I put those things even the food we spent days shooting the food in, in second unit and I decided that I was not going to have the camera lead everyone I was gonna let my cast lead the camera and and I'm, that was like a big leap for me. And I, and I think the other thing for me was, and I, and I mean this, you know, I, you know they shove uh, you know, a film by and auteur theory and all that into your head all through school and it's like tied up in your self-esteem. And I just couldn't take a film by credit on this because it would just be the biggest lie. I mean, they, they took ownership of it, you know, and I'm just so grateful that they did. Did I get um, the credit? You made us feel. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. You made us feel we all owned it. I mean, that's a big deal. It is. Look, I'm hitting him already. <laughs> so, Robert, are you able to walk us through, just right before we get to audience questions, and I've seen these audience questions and they're delicious. Um, give us a quick 30 seconds, if it even fits in 30 seconds, of from end to end, how much time it took to complete this film? Because I think that would be useful information for how everyone here. How much time it took to, to do the film? Is yes. It, and you're asking. Robert. Um, 35 days, uh, 18 days of principal, 17 days of second unit, including shooting matchbox cars and shrinking them down because we didn't have time to drag a bunch of 80s cars around. Did you know I did that craziness? Um, we were all done by around Labor Day of, of 18, which was way too late to market the film and try to sell it. Um, and then I just kept messing with it, and I did. I, I think I did the last two shots in August, Jeff. I reshot the title cards with, I wanted to get that whole movie motif, like I shot that in August. I got a new Italian song for it in August. I did a remix in August, so, you know, I'm, I'm done, pretty much. But yeah, I guess, you know, that was, just it took a minute. <laughs> 
So earlier in the conversation you touched on, or each of you touched on how memorable it was to be on set. Is there one story that um, anyone can share with us that um, sticks out the most to you? Can you remind me of anything? I, I think, I'm sorry. Kelly? Trauma's a hard thing. Well, I was always cooking in the kitchen with your mom. Yeah. And we would just cook and gossip and cut and gossip and shred and gossip. <laughs> and it was a gift. It was a gift to have her there. I mean that sincerely. And it was never about her. It was a great lesson for actors always to learn, it seemed to me. And she had such a wonderful sense of humor, even about things that, I mean, come on, a room full of actors and a very extraordinary human being. So there. <laughs> a lot of living, too. Robert? Not all of it's good. Talk to us a little bit about how you came up with the story. Oh, you know, it's um, it, these. It just, it's like, you know, how long does water drop on a piece of granite until it makes something happen? But it was a, it was a graphic novel. For it us. was a graphic novel, mm -hmm. but even for t almost ten years before that, I had been videotaping my grandfather and his brothers, you know, and and c trying to capture this stuff. But I, I my in, my storytelling lie elsewhere, and it wasn't until that I did the the online comic strip that became the graphic novel that got, you know, got an Eisner nomination. It was a pretty big deal. Um, that, you know, that I started seeing it gel, that it could be a film. I mean, because people ask me, they say, oh, you must be inspired by Moonstruck. And I'm like, no, no, actually not at all. You know, I'm more like Four Weddings and a Funeral and Annie Hall in Manhattan or, and, and actually Cassavetti's Husbands. Those were all in my head playing when I was making this film, if I'm being genuine. So, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know when that one moment is I think it's just I think it's just there's a little hamster wheel somewhere down there in the cerebral cortex just spinning, you know, and it's just going, okay, all right, there's enough imagery here. Now go go try to put something on a piece of paper. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about funding as well. Oh God. Uh, not <laughs> and not we don't need to get extensive um, here. You can give us a quick spiel about um, the 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 joy or the heartache of how you secured funding for this film? Well, I uh, paid for uh, most of it from my bar mitzvah money, I think it was. <laughs> um, my brother, Jeff, who's one of my producers, and my other two producers, John Michaels and Scott Whitty, um, are just uh, very tenacious and just didn't give up. And it, somehow they connected with investors who, who got it. And we just jumped in and, and we did it. And um, I, honestly, I, as at Thanksgiving, right, like the week before we started really casting the film, I, I remember at Thanksgiving dinner saying to my wife, you know, if it doesn't happen, what am I going to do? You know, it doesn't, I don't know if it's going to happen. And then it just like happened. I mean, then I'm talking to him and I'm like, oh my God, I'm talking to her. Because in both their instances, it was just instantly, you know, it was like they had the, he had this quality, this I thought my grandfather was John Wayne, you know, I mean, he just had this quality. And, and with Lynn, I, I said, I thought my, my great grandmother, true story, one time I would always go out there trying to get free meals, especially in college, you know, and I pulled in one day, you know, just hoping to get a sandwich, and, which was not a problem. And she had her hair down. I'd never seen her hair down. It was always in a bun with glasses on and it went below her knees. And I remember I said, you're gorgeous. She was gorgeous. And I, and I didn't know, she was 90, you know, and she's gorgeous. And I, and I said, I need, the actress that plays Nani has to be funny, she has to be fierce, but she better be gorgeous and sexy or it's not gonna work for me. Right. Okay. I, Ronnie and I have discussed this. So, you know, I got, I got everything I wanted. You gave us everything we wanted to do as actors, uh, with the humor, with the pain, with the ego, all of the things that we have in our life. And that's what just knocked me out. That's why I knew I had to do it. It was, um, it was unique, and it is unique. It doesn't make it easy, 
but boy, it was so wonderful to do. And the whole environment was amazing. And I think that's in the film too. The, the connection between people. It was a wonderful, wonderful group. And uh, thank you for that. That was, I really feel you're no, you're no better than the people you get to work with. And if you get to work with wonderful people, it's wonderful. <laughs> and if you get to work with shit, well, you know. <laughs> well, on that note, um, let's thank Lynn, Robert, and Paul for coming out. Thank you.